With that, I'm going to introduce our panelists to the stage. Jessica Black. <laughs> Layla Motley. <laughs> Kat Brooks. and Angela Davis. <laughs> Woo. Yo, sometimes I love my life. <laughs> Today is a good day. Y'all give it up one more time for the culture. <laughs> Dr. Ayodele, word slanger in Zynga and Destiny Arts Center, saving our babies with culture and art. We love y'all so much, so much. So some of y'all know me. Uh, I don't get nervous very often. But this is like a full circle nervous, <laughs> Ms. Davis. Um, <laughs> I moved to Oakland in 2007. I'm gonna tell a story real quick and get on this. And my first acting gig, no lie. Uh, and you know how you Oaklanders are about non-natives. My first, my first acting gig was to reenact one of your speeches in uh, Little Bobby Hutton Park. No pressure there. <laughs> Um, but it's also for a circle because as I, I finished the speech and I was sitting backstage and I was hyperventilating and waiting for people to come flog me because I had messed up the words of Ms. Davis and who but comes around the corner, Ms. Erica Huggins. And I just sort of collapsed in tears. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be in space with all of you today. I'm really excited for this conversation. I also want to acknowledge that Council Member Nikki Bass is in the house. All right, we have a short amount of time and lots of things to get through, so let's get to it. So in my time um, as an organizer, I found that the word abolition, the term abolition, is deeply personal to people. And that on any day I could ask, you know, a different person, what does abolition mean to you? Define abolition, what does it look like when we get there? and people have very different answers. And so I want to start, uh, I'll start with you, Layla, if that's all right. Um, I would like each of you to offer your personal and political definitions of abolition. Um, there are so many, and I think that that's, um, that's part of what makes abolition an expansive practice, is that it is about demolishing what we know. And I also think that that is one of the reasons why people fear it, is because as humans, we fear what we don't know, what we haven't lived, what we haven't experienced. And so abolition is partly about um, stepping into that fear, stepping into that unknown and recognizing that in a system, with systems and institutions and, and mindsets, patterns of thinking um, that are founded in white supremacy, we have to entirely step out of what we know in order to not just recreate that system in another iteration. Um, and so a huge part of it for me is thinking about how do we reimagine? Um, what does it look like to remove the carceral logic from our brains and from our relationships and from the ways in which we navigate the world and how can that change the systems and um, and looking at it instead of looking at it as uh, destruction or ruin, but as a chance for something that we didn't even know was possible um, and, and looking at possibility and um, all of the options of what could be um, instead of just what was and is. Thank you, Layla. Ms. Jessica. <laughs> so 
So abolition for me, definitely personal and political. I'm gonna mix it in together. Abolition for me looks like growing up in Atlanta, watching police officers come into our community and strip all of the brothers who were protecting us day in and day out, walking us to school buses. Abolition looks like, to me, watching the police officers walk into our neighborhoods, rape women, plant drugs on people. Abolition looks like, to me, being a mother who was stripped of her right to her son because this system thought for some reason it was okay to incarcerate him and try to strip him of his dignity. Abolition looks like to me the eradication of these racist systems that exist in this society. We are the people and we can self-determine what things look like for us. Abolition to me looks like radical reimagination where everybody's voice is included in the solutions that we come up with. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Well, first of all, let me say how wonderful it is to be in this space with all of you, reflecting on these issues. And thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, um, I'm going to try to be succinct. <laughs> it's not my best quality. Well, <laughs> I'm not interrupting you, so. <laughs> um, But uh, since we've already had um, such interesting and probing uh, efforts to get at the meaning of abolition, you know, I'm going to say that um, oftentimes we assume that abolition is primarily about getting rid of something. Uh, uh, and this is the, the mistake uh, we made with slavery. It may be the case that um, slavery was legally abolished, but what wasn't, uh, and Du Bois uh, uh, writes about this in Black Reconstruction in America, what was not uh, addressed um, were all of the ways in which slavery had uh, uh, defined the economic and social and political and cultural fabric of this country. And that is why we're doing the work we are today. Uh, we're trying to get rid of all of the um, influences and resonances uh, of slavery. But what I really want to say is that rather than assume that uh, the major uh, project of abolition is simply to get rid of something. Uh, the question we ask is how to create a new world and how to create a world that does not need racist and repressive uh, institutions like um, the police, like prisons, uh, uh, like um, uh, the the uh, the assaults on uh, on on families, especially uh, black families and families uh, of color, uh, that uh, uh, we associate with the um, what Dorothy Roberts calls uh, the family policing system. Uh, and so I totally appreciate what you said, Jessica. And I totally appreciate what you said. And I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, I just uplift uh, Dorothy Roberts' new book, Torn Apart. Uh, folks should definitely pick that up. There's an interesting thing that's happening right now in the public debate, right? Um, abolition is on the lips of mainstream media pundits. Um, we saw presidential candidates, now regardless of what they were saying about it, but we saw presidential candidates have to use the word defund. All of this is, right, and, 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 and one of the biggest pushes, um, successful challenges, potentially successful challenges to the status quo of how America does so-called public safety. All of that has collided, right, with, with the impact of the economic pandemic. Right, which made the hungry, starving, the housing insecure, uh, homeless, the right, 
the exacerbated already dire conditions pushing thousands of folks into what some of us refer to as the underground economy. And so there's been this spike in, I hate the word crime, there's been this, this spike, right, of, of violence in our communities. That's a fact. It's not because of defund, defund didn't happen anywhere. Facts. My question, uh, and I'll start with you, Ms. Davis. My, my, my question is, help us understand, right, that despite uh, the attempt to make abolition the boogeyman, <laughs> right, that's gonna make us more unsafe, how actually these conversations about abolition in these direst of times are exactly the conversation we need to be having. Abolition as a pathway to safe communities. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking so hard about your question that I forgot to pick up the microphone. Uh, um, but you know, what we are also witnessing are efforts to render abolitionist strategies ineffective. Uh, uh, and of course, we should know that, uh, especially those of us who've been around for a little while. Um, that uh, whenever we appear to be moving forward, and, 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 and you know, let's think about the amazing actions of the summer of 2020. I don't want us to forget that, uh, uh, because that was an indication that huge numbers of people in this country are willing now to do the work that will ultimately eradicate the influence of, of slavery and colonialism uh, and will take seriously the need to get rid of uh, structural racism. Uh, and during that period, huge numbers of people also began to recognize collectively that racism is not about you know, some people not liking Asian Americans or not liking indigenous people, or, or, uh, and that all you have to do is to make sure all of the individuals think deeply about their attitudes uh, and change. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> no, racism is primarily about all of the institutions that continue to work regardless of what individuals think or feel. And, and that was a new insight, uh, even though you know, some, people, some of us have been saying that for 50 years. <laughs> I mean, I can remember those conversations happening when I was a teenager, right? Um, but I think uh, um, enough people, not only in this country, because it's not only about the US. You know, racism is not just a product of the United States of America. Uh, racism emerges from colonialism, uh, uh, you know, and white supremacy that exists in, in Europe, that exists in South America, and that exists in Africa as well. So, um, so yeah, um, it's good that these conversations are happening right now. But let's also recognize that a lot of the responses constitute efforts to shut down the conversations. And I mean, I'm gonna say something that some people may get upset about. Uh, but you know, all of these DEI formations, there's, there's diverse, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in every single institution in this country now. And, um, <laughs> oftentimes, those institutions are totally unwilling to transform themselves. They assume that all you have to do is, you know, bring more Latinx people, bring more indigenous people, you know, more black people, more Asian people into the institution that itself has not changed at all. So it's about changing 
in order not to change, in order not to deal with the fundamental questions. Uh, and, and, and let me just say, uh, Kat, that I don't know if we're ever really going to get there. And I think it may actually be a good idea to stop thinking about you know, freedom or abolition as a destination, as something that we will recognize as a, as a signpost uh, in our trajectories uh, that indicates to us that we can stop, that it's no longer necessary to struggle. There will always be issues around which we struggle. Uh, and each time we win one victory, we learn about you know, all of those uh, um, uh, other issues that we had failed to take into consideration. Uh, so I think it's an infinite process. And, and you know, some people might get a little upset about that, because they just want to get there where they can say that you know, I'm free. But I think about Nina Simone. I wish I would know how it feels to be free. And Toni Morrison, who says, who said always that the function of freedom is to free someone else. So you're never gonna actually get there where there's nothing left to do. And let me stop there. That's actually a really good segue to, to my next question, um, because people do often talk about abolition as this thing, you know, it's, it's way over there. What One day, um, we're, we're gonna get there. Um, and then there are people will challenge and they'll say, well, what will it look like when it happens? How will we know? Um, and what is, what is true and factual is that abolition canon is happening right now, right? Um, to, to your point about 2020, one of the things that we saw as a turning point, right, was actually an embracing of abolitionist practices by communities. Now, they didn't know that that's what they were doing, but we made a good enough argument, i.e., if upwards of 50% of the people that police are murdering in the middle of, are in the middle of a mental health crisis, why do we continue to, to send police, right? Like, we, we made that argument. Now, we'd been screaming it for quite some time, um, but what we see right now is like even in the face of the backlash against defund, the disinformation, the misinformation campaign, the demonization, the criminalization of activists and organizers, municipalities and grassroots organizations across the country have held on to this concept of non-carceral response to mental health crisis, right? Um, one, one little bitty step. D D Jessica, the, 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 pass of the passing of the George Floyd resolution, right? 10 years, and that's the other thing I need folks to understand, like movements ebb and flow and they are consistently building on top of each other. The George Floyd resolution did not just happen, right? And most of it didn't happen in front of cameras, actually. Um, it is a step toward abolitionist practice inside of our schools, right? The decriminalization of our children by that system. I wanna know from you, where are you seeing abolitionist practice right now I'm a shout out mental health first in Oakland. Where are you seeing abolitionist practice right now um, that gives you hope? Going back to what you said in the beginning, the fact that the conversation is happening, what we're experiencing is all the things that we've been talking here. We were able to successfully eliminate an entire policing department, but there's still a culture of policing. <laughs> and so if we don't shift the ideology which means we have to be having the conversation in order to have the other side of that conversation, which is about the reimagining of what is possible, then removing an institution doesn't mean anything. So where I am seeing some strides is we're seeing strides on the ground. We're seeing strides on some school campuses. Now this is still a system that's inside of an institution that has many, it's a beast as we all know, many different races, structures, and practices, but there's an embracing of community that is starting to exist that didn't before. Partnering with community-based organizations who are experts in certain areas. There's a lot of work to do. It looks really good, and I don't want to discredit any of the hard work that we've done, but it's not over yet. 
we're still fighting these in weekly meetings every day to make sure that the community has the respect that they're warranted, to make sure that they're adequately paid in these positions that they're holding down. So I think what gives me hope is the fact that we are having these discussions and we are putting ourselves in a position to push back on these false narratives. And that, to me, is hopeful. Every time I see students who are like, no, we don't want police, and here's what we do want, and we're able to work with them, and we're able to fight with them to fight for what they want, and they're able to get a restorative justice coordinator, that's hope. And it's inspiration because we need organizers. So when our babies have incremental wins, it's a spark, a seed that's planted, that maybe one day they'll continue the legacy of organizing. Yeah, right? Layla or Ms. Davis, are there, um, Ms. Davis, excuse me, are there instances of abolition right now that you're seeing that, that make you hopeful? I will say mental health first was, was such a big one because in Oakland in particular, you know, there's this public attitude towards people in mental health crises, particularly unhoused people, where we are the only answer we've ever had is call the cops. And, um, and particularly for those of us who are in the practice where we don't want to engage with the carceral system, having an alternative has been just absolutely incredible. So the work that APTP is doing with Mental Health First definitely is huge. Shout out to the volunteers, not me, the volunteers that man those phone lines on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when I was their age, I was certainly doing other things. Um, <laughs> from you because you've got this global perspective of all these things that are happening. Well, you know, I can remember uh, when, you know, those of us who were encouraging conversations about evolution would talk about uh, the possibility of abolishing prisons as the dominant mode of punishment. Um, the generalized response was, Girl, you must be crazy. <laughs> you know? I mean, I can remember when very few people were willing to think seriously about the possibility of getting rid of prisons. Uh, um, and even those who, uh, who had relatives behind bars, and even people who have been incarcerated. Uh, and that is because police and prisons are so much a part of the ideologies we inhabit and that inhabit us that it becomes you know, almost um, impossible to imagine what it would be like uh, without these institutions. Uh, now, of course, people generally tend to think that the entire society is going to remain the same, and all you do is get rid of police and get rid of prisons. And obviously, that's not going to work. Uh, uh, and, and so over the years, uh, we've begun to have conversations about um, what kind of society would not have to rely on these institutions of violence and racism. And that means we have to talk about capitalism. <laughs> you know, that means we have to talk about a whole range of social, economic, and political institutions and ideas and ideologies in order to um, imagine, and, 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 and thank you so much for you know, raising uh, both of you, uh, the um, role of the imagination uh, uh, in, in, in attempting to um, reach an awareness of possible futures. And, and I'm excited about this uh, because I'm, you know, I'm aware that we're only here in this space today because of what people, uh, our ancestors did many, many decades ago, centuries ago. 
And we have to imagine ourselves in the same situation, not so much in accomplishing as accomplishing a discrete goal right now. Um, and capitalism encourages us to think in those terms. Capitalism encourages us to think in terms of the lifespan of one individual. The individualism of capitalism is so devastating that, that aside from um, indigenous people and others who have different kinds of um, philosophies and cosmologies, that we don't tend to think about our role in creating a world that may unfold 50 years from now or 100 years from now. And so I think what's so exciting about these conversations about abolition is that um, they're uh, bringing up all of the, the kinds of connections, uh, the connection with feminism. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know uh, whether we've had enough conversations about the relationship between abolition and feminism and about the, the role that um, women and non uh, gender non-conforming people have played in uh, popularizing abolition. Um, and you know, I'll just say this, there, there, there are a number of people in the audience who were involved in critical resistance organizing. Uh, uh, how many years ago was that? 25 years ago, oh yeah, that's Cassandra Shale and Gina Dent, both of whom were involved with, and are there any other critical resistance folks in the house? Or maybe the current instantiation of critical resistance. <laughs> um, but critical resistance was the first formation that decided to push seriously uh, for um, abolitionist approaches uh, toward uh, um, prisons and to uh, uh, urge people not to think about prison reform because prison reform has created all of the problems. The better prisons have been, has, have gotten, the worse they are, the more repressive they are, the larger they are. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, that, that group that created the first conference that took place in 1998 uh, consisted of about, um, I don't know, maybe 30 people. And about 25 of them were women and gender nonconforming people. So I just want to put that out there because women uh, generally get erased. And, 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 and women are the ones who have historically done most of the work around social justice. And especially black women. Come on now. And let's also uh, take into consideration that there are uh, abolitionist groups all over the world. This is not just happening in the US. We tend to be too US centric. Uh, uh, and that we can learn a great deal from what's happening in Brazil and what's happening in South Africa and many other places. Um, but you. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you keep teeing up the next question for me, so thank you for that. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, Reimagine, right? Reimagine public safety. Uh, folks have a hard time embracing something that they can't see, touch, feel, right? Uh, we humans very much need to like be able to see it, I think, so we can control it. Um, artists, right? Uh, one of the things that used to drive me mad as an artist, right, was that we always get brought to the table last minute. Right, so we've planned this rally, we've done da, 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 da. Oh, by the way, will you come spit a poem? Sure, okay. I might also have a political analysis, right, that, that goes, goes, goes along with, with me showing up. Um, artists are the conscious, of, they should be, right, the conscious of our communities. They also help us see things that we couldn't see before, imagine things, right, that weren't in our psyches before. Uh, they create whole worlds through paintings and songs. And so Layla, 
I want to turn to you um, and have you talk a bit about the intersection of art and activism and the role of the artists in helping us um, bring into being the, the world that most of us wake up, or a lot of us, excuse me, wake up every single day and fight for. I mean, I create this distinction between art and activism that has such a, a close and necessary relationship. Because if activism and organizing is the way we contend with the past and the present and think about the possibilities for the future, then art is the way we reflect the past and the present and create those possibilities for the future. And if we don't have that ability to dream, especially as black people, we've been deprived of the, the time, the space, the the ability to rest and imagine and have that relief, that space, that expansiveness. And that is necessary to having this kind of organizing be sustainable. Um, you can't sustain if you don't have that hope, really. And, um, and if you aren't able to constantly rethink. Um, and then I also, I think that it, art decreases the distance that we are able to have um, between ourselves and kind of the idea of the abstract politic. Um, because when we get so deep inside theory and concept, we tend to remove ourselves from it. And the minute we remove ourselves from it, we feel no responsibility to engage. And art is what, what decreases that distance. You, when you love a character, a song, um, when you when you learn to invest in in something um, through feeling first, then it's so much harder to remove yourself from the accountability of what that looks like in day to day practice. Yes. Yes. Do either of you want to add anything to that? <laughs> No, that's very beautiful. Thank you so much uh, for emphasizing how, how important art is to our capacity to envision and engage in uh, work that will change the world. Uh, because artists do that all the time, right? Uh, by creating something that has never been created before. Uh, so thank you so much for that, Layla. I appreciate it. And I'll, I'll just add one last thing to that. It also artists also create spaces for conversations that people aren't willing to have anywhere else, right? So they may not want to come listen to people scream FTP on, on the corner of 14th and Broadway, but if we can get them in a 99 seat black box theater with folks like Dr. Ayadele and Zynga as your director, you're having a different. You know, you can have some conversations there. Um, Ms. Davis, you also brought up black women at the forefront uh, of this work, right? Um, it's the way it's been, it's the way it is, the way it's likely to continue to be. There's a conversation that we're having right now uh, in Oakland um, around the cost to black women being on the forefront of this work, the visible pushers of this work, and the silent permission that has been given to allow violence and threats of violence against black women that are on the forefront of this work in order to hold on to or achieve a political objective. I'm talking about what's going on with Council Member Carol Fife. I'm talking about what happens with me. I'm talking about what I know Jessica's going through, Melina Abdullah, Doc, uh, Ms. Davis, I can't imagine <laughs> what you've held and walked through. My question is about sustainability and healing justice, specifically for black women, as we hold this work in the face of such vitriol and violence. And I know it wasn't on the questions I sent out, but I just think it's too critical of a conversation because if we're not taking care of black women, then I'm not sure where our movement goes. Ms. Davis, I'd like to start with you. Uh, 
Well, first of all, I, I think it would be important in this conversation um, to recognize that um, evolution, abolitionist approaches require us to think about the ways in which uh, we t tend to reproduce that which we are opposed to. Uh, because oftentimes one uh, can uh, clearly identify with efforts to challenge the police and get rid of prisons, but then inside a relationship, those same impulses to punish, to hurt, to get back at someone, they emerge. And that's like doing the work of the state, doing the work of our enemy. So it is very important, I think, to uh, recognize how uh, carcerality affects our lives and our, our, our relationships. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes you hear, and I'm thinking about uh, Brazil, for example, uh, where there's a powerful black women's movement, Colombia. Uh, but in, in, in Brazil, there was a slogan, uh, when black women rise, the entire world rises with us. Uh, that uh, uh, black women are not some uh, marginal um, uh, demographic, uh, but rather when black women struggle, we always struggle for everyone else. And so assaults against black women are also assaults against the very movement uh, for a better life. Uh, uh, and so I'm, I, I have to say that, as uh, you pointed out, I've been around a long time. Uh, you know, um, I'm going to turn 79 this week. Yay! <laughs> Make a little bit more noise for that. Yes. And I don't... <laughs> but let me, I, I mean, I... I didn't tell you that just to tell you. <laughs> there was a point that I, I wanted to make. Uh, that I never thought that I would experience a moment uh, when there would be widespread conversations, public conversations about abolition. I always, and I think, you know, those of us who've been doing the work, we always imagined that it was gonna, it was gonna happen, but it was gonna happen um, decades from now, and that we would not be alive to witness the, the ways in which uh, uh, people began, would begin to shift toward a different way of thinking about uh, uh, what is called, you know, public safety and security. And today, uh, we can see uh, the fruits of our labor. Oftentimes, you don't get to see, you don't get to experience it. And you shouldn't count on experiencing it, uh, because we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for everyone, including for those uh, who are not yet born. Uh, I mean, that is the only way struggle for freedom makes sense. And thank you so much for you know talking about freedom and. And, 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 and liberation. This is, and, and, and I do want to say that what is so remarkable about black people, and I'm not saying this uh, just because I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that what is so incredible is that for, for centuries, that impulse to struggle has been passed down from one generation to the next. I mean, if you, if, if you think about uh, uh, what it means for that, that impulse to have been renewed over and over and over again, and we're talking about renewing it for generations to come. I mean, that's actually remarkable. I mean, that is why black history is important. Not so much because it's about black people, but because it is about 
the quest for freedom because it is about infinite uh, movement toward liberation. Uh, and, and, and that's why I think I was saying that I don't think, I don't think we should think of it as, a, as, a, as a, um, uh, an endpoint. Uh, as it's, it's not a destination. It's rather the journey itself. And in the course of engaging in that journey, we become aware of, of so much more um, and of, of, of how um, freedom is so expansive and so capacious. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, finally, that uh, it's, it's, it's important to, to see the impact um, that LGBTQ communities and, and, and trans communities have had in not only shifting the way we all think about, um, about issues of, of, of gender and about the binary conceptions of gender, but rather about changing the world uh, more broadly. Because what is, what is, what is, mo what was most quote, normal than the binary notion of gender. And the trans community and its allies have completely blown that away. And if that can happen, there is, there is no limit to what we can do. Uh. As probably gonna say this to the end, but before we move on, I, I do just thank you. Thank you. Thank you to, to, to those of you who did do the work, continue to do the work on whose shoulders we stand as we do this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica. <laughs> Um, I, I, I want to I circle back, and Leila, I want to give you an opportunity as well um, to circle back to, to this idea of, um, and actually, thank, Ms. Davis, you helped me frame the question, I, I think, even a little more specifically, right? Because a lot of times the answer to what do we do when somebody harms us is harm, to your point. That's the American way. Um, but we're trying to build a new way. So talk about, right, inside of abolitionist principles and values, how we then deal with the types of violence and vitriol that white supremacy generates. I think there's a few um, things, so I'm gonna also try to be succinct, because it's lots of things. <laughs> um, back to healing justice, we have to make sure that we're doing the work. Many times when um, folks are on the front lines, they're healers and they are inspiring other people. Um, they're showing people like what they already know exists and lives inside of them. But how is the healer being healed? How is the healer being filled? And there needs to be more intentionality on that. The other thing that I think is um, just lessons learned, like these conversations have to be talked about. And when we're doing all of our organizing strategy, we need to be thinking from this lens as well and developing and creating strategies for our folks that are on the front line. And I think one way to do that is through the political education and studying what existed before and what strategies existed there as well. I think I've always known that there was a risk doing the work and the risk has looked like several things. It didn't just look like, you know, threats um, from racist, you know, folks, but it also looked like the sacrifice that had to be made for my children. So 
while being on these front lines fighting against the school to prison pipeline, I'm also going to jail to see my son. <laughs> while being on the front lines fighting against the school to prison pipeline, I'm also sitting behind a door with about 50 white folks fighting for my daughter to have access to education, which was already fought and won, public education, but push out. And I think we have to, we have to consider all of those things and figure out how we also wrap around each other because this is a collective thing, the things that we're fighting for on a collective basis. You know what I mean? And so I think what I've seen just in my own orientation and watching the generations of my family organize is that oftentimes the priority is everybody else and you forget about like what you're going through and what your connection is to that. And that we have to figure out ways to be more intentional, to create space so that people feel okay having those conversations and that they're not victimized um, or feel like a victim. Because a lot of times healers ain't got no time for that. You know, it's like, I'll be okay, come on, let's help you. But we need to start putting self-reflective um, practices inside of our work so that we're actually doing the work. My elders used to tell me the work, we are the work. You got it. So in order to imagine, in order to reimagine alternatives, you also have to be doing that work on yourself because we have been through so much trauma. And I think through that work, that's how we come up with those alternatives to some of the violence that exists. And I'll stop there, but there's more around organizing. I'll be quiet. Thank you. Layla. Yeah, I mean, I talk about this a lot um, when I'm talking about my book because I wrote this book about police sexual violence, right? And I think at the core of it, it's that this world does not see black women and black girls who are turned into black women far before they are, um, doesn't see us as vulnerable. And if this world doesn't see us as vulnerable, then it sees no reason to protect us. And that pushes us into the front lines because we're used to a certain amount of hypervigilance. We're used to doing it ourselves. We're used to protecting ourselves. We're used to there not being safety for us. And so in like an abolitionist framework, we need community care in order to function, right? But how are we supposed to care for each other when the impact of white supremacy within our relationships is there? So, you know, black men often continue to perpetrate that within their relationships to black women because of the role that we've been put into. And, and so when we expect so much from black women, um, there's no space for healing because healing isn't safe because we're so used to doing everything. It's dangerous to stop. It's dangerous to confront. And so, I mean, in my family, there's so many generational practices of don't talk about it. Because if we talk about it, then we have to feel it. And if you feel it, how do you keep fighting and working? How do you protect yourself? And so a huge part of what we need to do is dismantle that within our relationships so that we can provide ourselves the community care that allows us the foundation to heal um, and to confront. Thank you for that. And I'll just, I'll just say two things that I think are, are really important, right? We're talking about state violence and black women and girls, that sexual assault is actually the primary way that black women and girls experience state terror. Celeste Squab was uh, the rule, not the exception. And that we're having this conversation as 12, 13, 14 year old black children are being bought and sold in broad daylight just a couple of miles from here. We drive by them every day, every single day. Um, I think we have, we're gonna collect questions now, I think. Yeah, don't wanna interrupt this, this moment, but I wanna remind everyone, if you're finished with your questions for the panel, go ahead and send them to the aisle, the end of the aisles here, and the volunteers will come by and collect those from you. 
I want to I want to stay here on this thread a little bit, uh, black black women and girls, but we can expand it. Um, some I want to talk inside particular paradigms, right? Like how we achieve, how we talk about the pathway to get to um, abolition inside of certain paradigms. Right? I'm thinking about intimate partner violence, domestic violence, right? So I mentioned. Um, that, that we've, we've been able to hold on, I think, nationally to this idea, and it's growing, that law enforcement should not be the first responders, in our opinion, any responder to mental health crisis, right? It's become an easier conversation like to, to have. That is not the case <laughs> when we say to people that there should be a non-carceral response to intimate partner violence. That's when people don't look at me and say, girl, you must be crazy. Right, like, okay, Kat, we walked with you this far, we did this too much. Um, but the facts are, right, that, that for 40 plus years now, we've used the carceral state to respond to intimate partner violence, and women and girls are no safer. We're actually less safe, right, and or incarcerated for trying to do for ourselves what the state said it was going to do and failed to do. I mean, I could go on and on, right? Um, so I, I, I want to I wanna talk about abolition inside of that, that paradigm, right? Like when abolition as a response, ab as abolition as the response to, to violence. Um, Jessica, do you want to start? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here having several thoughts because I'm thinking about like, even when we're having the conversation like around, you know, like domestic violence and things like that, it's the, the repetitiveness of violence. Um, thinking about what we're really trying to do when we're getting to, when we're thinking about abolition and we're thinking about the attack on capitalism. There has to be a way that we deal with the generational trauma there's, there's generational trauma on both sides. There's generational trauma um, in black men that need to be healed. There's generational trauma in black women that need to be healed. And so I think that, as you were saying, Layla, those are conversations that inside of community, inside of our communities, inside of our families, that oftentimes, let's just be real, people don't have the tools to be able to have those conversations or even begin to know how to have the conversation to get on the path of healing. And so it seems like as we're even talking about, back to the first question you asked, when we're thinking about even political education, there has to be a way that we're able to be in spaces, be inside of our families and have that and have healing work. The, the trauma that we experience as a people, period, is egregious. And we don't know how to digest that always, and we always don't know how to process that, which then becomes some of the effects of all these other things that we see. You know, being a black woman in America, having, you know, a black son and a black daughter, I see the trauma both ways. I'm able to see it both ways. And I think that there's very specific things and spaces that black men need to be in collectively along with elders and, and lessons learned in that way um, in order to support their growth and development. And then I also think that there's very specific ways that black girls need to be held in community with elders. I think elders in our community is so important. Uh, we didn't get to talk about this, but again, I'm gonna come at everything from an organizing lens. That's why I think organizing, the, it's important to be multi-generational because everybody has a role. And when we start to exclude or forget about our elders, these are the things that I think that they could support in helping us be able to come up with processes, solutions, to be able to deal with these things. And oftentimes, when I look around at some of the stuff, you know, across the state and the country, it's more focused on just young people and the elders aren't, it's not necessarily a focus. And I think this was one of your questions, but you're not asking me this. 
I think one of the misses. <laughs> we call that self-determination. <laughs> I think one of the misses that we have in terms of the movement is how do we all fit and how do we make sure multi-generationally all the perspectives exist? And yeah, and so I think that every community, because you know, we're here, you know, talking about the black community in our conversation. But every community has their own cultural work that needs to be done. Every community has issues. Every community has problems. And every community needs to do their own healing work. I'm providing suggestions from my perspective, just from you know being a parent and being a black woman in America, about some of the things that I think that are missing and where those answers exist. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Well, the question is um, really important. It's a huge question. Um, uh, because you're right, uh, we see some changes in the ways in which people think about response uh, to um, certain situations such as uh, mental, mental health crises. Uh, and now we, 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 we learn that uh, in California and elsewhere, that the majority of calls that police actually receive have nothing to do with activity uh, that is constructed as criminal. You know, most of the police calls have to do with situations that require uh, people who are compassionate, uh, who are trained uh, to, you know, who are not trained primarily uh, in terms of instruments of, of violence, because that is what the police do, uh, but who, uh, uh, who, who can um, have the kinds of conversations with people who are in crisis that can let them know uh, that they want to help. That it's not about sending someone uh, to uh, jail or prison. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of the issue that you raised about sexual violence and you know, how do we reach the point uh, where we can th think about or urge non-carceral you know, responses uh, to uh, sexual violence? Uh, well, by the way, I uh, recently wrote a book along with um, my partner, Gina Dent, and uh, two other scholar activists that's called Abolition, Feminism, now, there's a period. Uh, that's why I stopped after each word. <laughs> it's the abolition period, feminism period. Uh, now, um, and you know, of course, um, we raise the point that uh, gender violence is the most pandemic form of violence in the world, and so if we're going to find any um, workable abolitionist responses, then we have to take into consideration how to trans transform the uh, typical ways of, 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 uh, of responding to you know, rape and other forms of gender violence. One of the things we recognize is that prisons rely on gender violence. They generate and regenerate and reproduce gender violence. And, you know, why is it that uh, we're in a situation where when people talk about guys going to prison, they oftentimes joke about rape in men's prisons. And then, of course, the prison itself encourages that kind of violence, including sexual violence, because it allows, um, it allows them to better control uh, the situation. Uh, so that's major. That's major. And when we begin to think about the very, the very process that is supposed to reduce gender violence actually has the effect of increasing it. And, are reproducing it. Uh, so 
what I would suggest is uh, looking at some of the amazing works that activists have done uh, in terms of figuring out you know, how not to have to call the police in those situations. What other ways uh, uh, can be used, and, 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 and including, um, you know, community shaming, you know? You know, why is it that, 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 that people who uh, engage in gender violence have to, uh, only have to uh, face the possibility of going to jail or prison? I mean, that's no big deal. Much worse would be shamed by the community to have everyone know that they are, you know, rapists, that they engage in this kind of violence. And, and you know, not only against uh, uh, people who identify as women, uh, but against all genders. Uh, so this, this is opening up uh, a very important uh, phase in the, in the work of abolitionism to figure out you know, how we can rid the world of the most widespread form of violence. And that also has to do with capitalism. Sorry, I want to keep coming back to capitalism. Uh, uh. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned uh, looking at the work of activists. I do just want to lift up um, Mimi Kim and the Interrupting Criminalization uh, work and the amazing guide that they just released that we based our guide off of. I mean, the, there are folks out there generating these answers. Um, Layla, do, did you want to add um, to this? I mean, I think Ms. Davis and Jessica covered so much of it as like the two distinct components are prevention, which is what kind of conversations do we need to be having within our families and our relationships um, in order to not continue to reproduce this, and then the response. And I think a lot of it is about harm reduction. How can we like immediately get people outside of a situation which they have a complete risk of harm. Like that is the first step and how do we do that outside of looking towards um, policing? And, and I think part of what we need is those grassroots organizations, ways in which it is easy to have, to know what resources you have and to use them. Um, and I think that, that that's a like constant challenge. Um, I love the point of communal shaming because it's something that we have a conversation about, especially like younger generations on the use of social media in order to circulate communal shame when a predator is existing within a community. And um, and I often hear like a response is, this is, um, this is like part of cancel culture and it's not okay because, um, because it like creates this punishment. But I almost see it as a consequence. The natural consequence of harming your community is increasing a distance between what your community trusts of you. And I think that that, that is incredibly important um, and needs to also be paired with how do we look at restorative justice? Is there space for redemption? Um, how do we forgive? How do you move forward? How do you change? Um, and, and I think those two things paired together are what makes a response, a communal shame response work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have some questions here. I'm going no 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 I'm going to, I'm going to try to read them all. I um I like segues, y'all. Um I'm going to I'm going to ask this question um because uh it comes from one uh, one of our young people that are here. Um, and this young person uh, would like to know, what do we do with the prisoners if the prisons are closed? Does someone want to take that? <laughs> I get to just ask the questions. I don't have to have answers today. 
my answer would be. There you go. <laughs> I think I don't think we have to have the answer right now. I think that we work with you, young people, and we we go back and we imagine where would you like to see them be? What does it look like? I don't think we have to have the complete answer for that right now. I think generationally, I'm sorry, you want to go? I think to your point, um, Ms. Davis, some of these changes aren't going to happen right now in our lifetime, but we can plant the seeds and start the conversation. And there will be other people that take the torches and continue to build it out. You know, I'm going to take another position on this question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to say is that I think that if the prisons were empty tomorrow, we would not have any more problems in what we consider the free world than what we're having now. And precisely because a lot of the sisters and brothers and other genders behind bars have been doing really important work over this last period. I mean, the intellectual energy inside prisons is amazing. That's right. That's right. And so what I would say to the person who asked that question is that we need to bring them home so they can help us figure out you know, how to make it without the entire planet being destroyed. Because, I mean, right now, uh, we are facing these crises that threaten to destroy the planet. I'm so glad we're not drinking out of plastic bottles up here uh, this morning, <laughs> this afternoon. Um, but. But yeah, I think that if we could use some of that energy and we could use some, you know, some of these, some of the people who've been in prison have been studying for 20, 30, 40 years. And I think they have a great deal to contribute in terms of finding solutions to a lot of the problems that we discussed on this stage this afternoon. I would just say before I ask the next question too, that the, the reality is that the vast majority of folks that are incarcerated actually are going to come home. They're coming back to our communities, right? Um, with, with little to no supports, leaving some of the most violent institutions in the world, they are coming home. Um, and we, we need to bring them home yes. sooner. Mumia Abu Jamal oh, should yes. be free. Yes. Yes. Leonard Peltier needs yes. to be free. Yes. I wasn't suggesting we wait. My, my, my point is, is, is that there's this idea, I think, among folks that believe that the carceral state solves our problems, that people go to prison and then they're there forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, and so it's okay in your minds to forget about them. A, to, no, it's not okay to forget about them. Yes, free them all to, right now. Right, right this second, and um, it's this cycle of violence, right? Um, we just cy keep cycling through, through violence um, with, with no actual and solution. Can I just say one thing? Yeah, you, you can know, say whatever um, you want. My <laughs> <laughs> but Rochelle McGee, who was my co-defendant, has been in prison for 55 years, and they will not release him. I mean, he's in his 80s now. And you know, what kind of system does that to human beings? Uh, I say free them all. Yay! Yes. I also think that like, we have this illusion that we're safe now and we're not, and, and part of this, we create this distinction between there are incarcerated people and then there are us, but incarcerated people are people, and if we didn't have some of the things that we do to incarcerated folks once they get released from prison, we might not even know that the person next to you was incarcerated. And when we have so many people who have been incarcerated, we have to think about like, how can you shift the mindset of not seeing incarcerated folks as other? 
because that enforces the idea of like criminality and this demonization of people who have been in prison. Mm -hmm. And I want to also just add to that, like as we're having this conversation, one thing that we have to be thinking about too is like, where's the next generation of organizers that is going to fight to get our people out? How are we raising up that next generation of organizers? Um, and I think that that's a relevant conversation we have to be having, like each one, reach one, teach one. The, the landscape of organizing is short right now, <laughs> and we need more young people, we need more parents, we need more students, we need community folks, we need more elders to actually be engaged in these fights. And so one of, when I was thinking about this, this response, it's like, how, how can we get these people engaged in these fights to learn? To learn, how do we fight to get them out? How do we come together? How do we bring more people into the fold to actually develop strategies or even continue strategies that already existed that did work to apply pressure so that our people are released? I did, I'm just gonna lift up um, Lamia's grandson who is actively organizing right now. Um, and, and so there's, there's lots of stuff on social media about ways you can plug in. Uh, to that campaign right at this moment. And, and the other thing I think I'll say is, is we talk about the incarcerated folks. There's also their children, their loved ones, their parents, right? My daddy did 10 years. That's, that's a base of folks that are ready right now to organize to bring their loved ones home. Um, this, I think, is an important question I want to get to before they, they, they um, shut us down, because this is moving right now, this conversation in California about reparations and which black people should get reparations and which black people should not get reparations, as if all black people in this country are not suffering the impacts of, of chattel slavery being the foundational economic engine of this country. So the question is, do you believe African Americans are due reparations? What do you believe that should look like? Uh, <laughs> Ms. Davis, I'm gonna start with you. Well, you know, abolition. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's it's really <clears throat> important to move away <clears throat> from assuming that reparations involves giving individuals money. I think that um, reparations uh, for uh, uh, black people in conjunction or in connection with the damage and the traumas that have been produced and reproduced since the era of slavery have a great deal with um, a creating a more radical, um, more radical democratic society. And as someone who's always believed in, um, well, for most of my life, believed in socialism and communism, you know, I would say. A, a socialist perspective uh, toward reparations uh, would would not so much mean giving every uh, person who is a descendant of those who suffered uh, those collective traumas uh, some money, but rather um, transforming our institutions. I think that free education, free education, and not just for black people, but free education for everyone should be the cornerstone of reparations. And I can you know, talk about you know, housing, and I can talk about health care, and all of the things that we need as human beings uh, in this society. I think that is the kind of collective approach, approach to reparations that would make sense. Layla, Jessica. I mean, how do you monetize a life? How do you determine how much our trauma is worth? How how is that possible? Um, I love I love that idea. I think that 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 makes sense to me because also you have to think about like money now, but also what if we had been able to buy houses, you know, 30 years ago before it cost $2 million to buy a house, you know? And so 
you have to be able to reverse time to actually repair from this. I don't think it's possible to fix it. And I think if that's the goal of reparations, like there is no way to fix it. And I worry that um, the state believes that then it will be over, then they will have owed us what they owed us and then it's done. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I will just say, right, in, in, in the work, we, we watch the state monetize our lives, right? Seems like a, a, a stolen black body is worth about somewhere between 500,000 and, and a mil, and then they do expect the parents to be done, for it to be over, right? Um, With the continuing fascism, racism, and other isms, how can we affect change other than politically? How do we collectively change hearts and minds? Jessica. No. <laughs> no, I'll go. I gotta alternate who goes first. <laughs> so I think I think the way that we collectively shift hearts and minds is one, is through our own actions, right? Like, we have to be showing that. We have to be reflections of what that looks like. And I do think, like I said earlier, it's about the mindset shift. So I think that people need to be exposed to other ways in order to change their paradigm. And, and there's ways out there that do exist. Um, there, there are people out there that are doing the work to support people in shifting their paradigms and becoming more self-aware so that as they become self-aware, then they're able to contribute to the collective. But people, again, have to be doing the work to heal themselves. Like, I wanna know a body of work that I think is important for people to look up. There's an organization called the Culture Wellness Center. It exists in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And they're doing a lot of deep healing trauma work. They're doing a lot of work to shift people's paradigms through the lens of, studying yourself to become. And people are on a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole scale of engagement from where people start into where they actually can be in a healthy formation of a community and giving back, thrive and third and um, flourish. So I think that maybe looking up those strategies would be important, but it's definitely a paradigm shift that can't be done without political education, depending upon how you f define political education. This question comes up on almost every panel. Um, and I, sometimes I crinkle my nose at it, but that's mostly just because I'm bad at it. Um, and that's the take caring, caring for self. And I, I think this, this question specifically says, how do you take care of yourself as an abolitionist knowing, I think they're reflecting on one of your answers, Ms. Davis, knowing this fight will continue past your generation? How do you sustain rest to remain in this journey? Can Sorry. I add another part to that question? Sh sure. Um, I guess I wonder, in, in the youngest generation, we have this kind of like a uh, catastrophic idea, which it might be very true, that um, the world is ending. And with the climate crisis, that we won't make it that many more generations. And so how do you contend with the hope and the fight while you're also contending with the idea that, you know, you might not be able to have children who make it through their lifetime, that it might not happen in your lifetime and there might not be another one. Yeah, I've got a 17 year old and that's what they're walking with very much is fighting for a world that they're pretty sure is ending. And um, there's a term for it now, there's a particular climate depression, climate depression. Ms. Davis. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they're right. Um, you know, whether the, you know, whether the, the planet lasts 
longer uh, than it is destined to last, given the damage uh, to the planet as a direct consequence of capitalism and as a direct consequence of, of not encouraging people to think about the generations that come after us. Uh, to, you know, as a, as, a, as a consequence of not encouraging people to think about the fact that this bottle of water that is made of plastic may eventually make it into the ocean and may kill, help to kill marine life. Uh, you know, capitalists don't care about anything except profit. They don't care what the consequences of their efforts to generate profit uh, 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 will be. And I think it's, a, it's so wonderful that young people are in the forefront of the struggle for environmental justice and, and the struggle against climate change. Um, because that has, that's ground zero of social justice. I mean, if we, if, if we you know, want to guarantee that the struggle for freedom continues uh, over the coming generations, then we also have to prevent the destruction of, of this world. And we also have to think about you know, all living things, animals and plant life. Uh, uh, and we don't have generally that capacious uh, sense of what it means to be alive and what it means to be alive with other living beings that are not human. And what it means to be a part of a culture in which progress or advance necessarily means a further destruction of this planet that we inhabit. Um, and I was just um, um, thinking about the fact that, uh, you know, we look at animals and, and th like ants, for example, who make these huge, um, you know, architectural uh, miracles, actually. And they, they use the earth, they move it. Um, but their intervention does not destroy the earth. Human beings can learn a great deal from non-human animals who know how to use what is produced by the earth without destroying it in the process. Uh, and I think that um, that sense of doom uh, is a consequence of not thinking deeply about what are real problems uh, and not being able to identify with those who will perhaps more directly witness the destruction uh, of, of this planet. But at the same time, I want to say that uh, this planet will eventually um, be destroyed. I mean, you know, who knows uh, if, if it has a long life? You know, it may be millions, but eventually it will no longer exist. And I don't know whether we have learned how to think about the processes of the universe and the universes we inhabit uh, so that we can be more careful, so that we can appreciate more what it means to live in this world today. All right, Oakland, show some town love for Layla Motley, Jessica Black, and Ms. Angela Davis. This has been a fire panel. Thank you so much.